Okay, it's preparing. We should be going live any second now. Preparing, we should be going live any second now. Welcome everybody to the virtual GA for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. I'm going to turn things over to the president of, of the RASC, Chris Gaynor. Greetings, everyone. I'm Chris Gaynor, the president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. 60 years ago in Montreal, the RESC held its first general assembly. And of course, today we were supposed to be uh, convening for the third day of our general assembly in Vancouver. Uh, However, as we all know, uh, COVID-19 uh, intervened in this situation. And so today we are holding our first online virtual General Assembly. I would like to start off by thanking Haley Miller and the, the great committee in Vancouver that really pivoted uh, when, uh, when we were forced to cancel the in-person General Assembly. And they put together this wonderful uh, presentation we have today. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to hear from uh, Canadian astronaut Joshua Kutrick, who is in uh, Houston, Texas today, where he's working on the uh, International Space Station uh, program. And he, last weekend, he was a, a capsule communicator on the uh, Dragon launch. Um, uh, in an hour from now, we will be hearing from uh, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Seeger, who is one of the world's great experts on exoplanets and a, a longtime member of the RESC. And then finally, in two hours from now, we're going to hear from uh, Bob McDonald of CBC's Quirks and Quarks. Uh, we, the RESC has, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, has produced a, a, a great deal of exciting online programming and we will be uh, continuing to do so after today. So keep an eye on uh, our ESC social media channels. And now uh, we will be hearing a message from uh, Her Excellency, the Governor General of Canada. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Marina Miller. And I'm Meredith Miller. And first we'd like to acknowledge that the Royal Astronomical Society of Vancouver is located on the unceded traditional Coast Salish territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Now we will be reading a, messenger, a message from the Governor General of Canada, Julie Payette. Space may be fi the final frontier for astronauts and Starfleet captains, but for most of us Earthlings, space is only accessible through the lens of a telescope. Fortunately, these days, the night sky is easy to observe with even basic instruments. The stars belong to everyone. For more than 150 years, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has supported astronomers across the country, young and old, encouraging them to look beyond the horizon. Through activities and educational programs, the RASC reminds us how much fun astronomy is and how the vastness of space can bring us together, even when worldwide challenges force us apart. At today's virtual assembly, you will have the chance to further your knowledge and to interact with some very well-informed experts. Among others, you will hear from my fellow Canadian astronaut, Joshua Kutrick. Don't be shy to ask him the really tough questions and don't forget to say hi to him from me. If you're curious about the universe or dream of boldly going where no one has been before, this is the place for you. And remember to look up. You never know what you might find out there in the stars. Live long and prosper, Julie Payette. Thank you both very much. Uh, and I'm going to toss things to um, Haley Miller to say hello for a moment as our, as our host. Hello, Phil, are you able to play the recorded video? Absolutely. You'd like me to do that now? Why don't you introduce people to what the video is? <laughs>
um, the West Coast First Nations. Sorry, you were muted there for, for a second. Could you, could you okay. do something? <laughs> yeah, I just want to introduce, it will be David Seaweed and he is the First Nations Coordinator, coordinator at, uh, Sim at Douglas College. And he's going to present um, some information about the uh, West Coast First Nations. Thank you. And just taking one second. I've lost the. Okay. Good morning. It's an honor and privilege today to welcome you to the I think it just needs. We, I think I'm on, on the camera, but we are going to be sharing a video. Is that? It's coming any second now. There it is. Amazing. Okay. There it is. Technology. Thank you. Good morning. It's an honor and privilege today to welcome you to the Kikite First Nations Territory on behalf of Chief Rhonda Larrabee. The Kikite Nation is the New Westminster Band, the land that Douglas College sits on. We also acknowledge the Coquitlam Nation, where our Coquitlam campus remains. These, we also acknowledge the Coast Salish people on whose unceded traditional territories we live, we learn, we play, and we do our work. And Chief Ron is welcome, she says. From time immemorial, our lands have been a place of gathering. Our ancestors welcomed us here to come together, to fish, to hunt, to gather berries, to share stories and wisdom by the river, a gathering place, a resting place. Canada's First Nations people look to the sky for guidance in practical endeavors and spiritual identity. Celestial mythology or storytelling about constellations has been shared through these generations. These sky stories created mental maps of the night sky. They also guided seasonal agriculture with the appearance of certain stars at certain times of the year. In the summertime, with plants alive and animals roaming, they do not talk of the sky stories, do not wishing to offend the spirits of living things. That is a tale from Anishinaabe people. I found an interesting conference, so to speak, uh, that is, takes place in North America called Teepees and Telescopes. Uh, it interested me to research a bit further. The Cree saw aurora borealis lights that meant that the indigenous spirits are dancing across the sky. The three stars from Orion's belt in some indigenous culture are seen as three hunters and in Cree are three chiefs. I share the hole in the sky story of the seven sisters or Pleiades, where the star woman saw earth from another dimension, fell through the hole in the sky and became the first woman on this planet. The hole is a wormhole or a spatial anomaly. Uh, you should be proud of me for looking up the pronunciation of Pleiades because when I looked at it, it was horrible to try and figure out. Three of the main celestial bodies that First Nations people talk about are Grandmother Moon, Mother Earth, and Grandfather Sun. These three bodies show up in a lot of First Nations storytelling. Unfortunately, through colonial process, the Indigenous astronomy culture has been minimized and marginalized, much like our languages but the knowledge keepers work hard to pass on their stories from generation to generation. I thank Jennifer Kirke for allowing me to welcome you today and for actually opening my eyes on some of the interesting storytelling culture of the skies. Uh, it's exciting to know that we can be a partner uh, when Jennifer brings up her big telescope to the gathering place and uses it for her classes. She's an amazing person, and I hope you guys have an amazing time today. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, David Seaweed. Um, I also just wanted to mention this t-shirt that I'm wearing. The RASP Virtual GA has an image and it was designed by the uh, president of the Vancouver Centre with the Big Dipper, the Burrard Inlet. I hope you can all see that. And the little um, observatory at the bottom left corner is the Simon Fraser University Trache Observatory that we do a lot of our events at. Um, I also wanted to mention that we are giving away two prizes today. Um, at the end of the talks, at the end of Bob McDonald's talks, we're gonna be giving away a light meter that was donated by Unihedron. And we're also gonna be giving away um, a choice. You can pick between two astro images that were taken by our my co-host, Matthew Simone, who is going to be joining us. And he um, took some of these images and donated them. And you can pick one of the images. One is the Orion Nebula and one is the Andromeda Galaxy. So please uh, go to the link um, on the RASC YouTube channel to enter for that prize that we'll be giving away at the end. And now I would like to introduce Joshua Kutrick, who is a Canadian astronaut uh, with the CSA and has just received uh, the astronaut um, the title of astronaut after finishing his training um, at Houston with NASA for two years and he as Chris had mentioned was um, last week at the launch for SpaceX and I think we're going to hear a lot more about that so I'm going to hand it over to Joshua. <laughs> Hey, thank you, uh, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, good day to, to everyone who's tuning in. Thank you for doing so. Uh, it's definitely a privilege to be able to be here and to talk with you all about spaceflight today. Um, you know, it's something that we like to do often. We haven't been able to do it that much that recently because we're affected down here by, by COVID like everyone else is. Um, so it's certainly good when technology comes together and and lets us do it like we're gonna do it today. It's almost uh, as though I'm at work and we're, we're talking to astronauts in space, the amount of technology and, and virtual means that we're trying to make work here together. Uh, so I am Josh Kutrick. Um, I'm a new astronaut at the Canadian Space Agency. I was hired about three years ago. And today I think well, I'll take a little bit of time to talk about um, uh, maybe a little bit about my path uh, about what I do now for, for sort of a day job and some of the training that I do, what I'm looking at in the future and I'll talk a little bit about the Canadian Human Spaceflight Program and then some of our other projects as well. I think we'll do some questions at the end. I'm going to try to share a screen here and I'll, as I, I like to say, I'll, I'll depend on uh, my co-presenters. -pres so if any of this is not working, you can't hear me or you can't see the screen, you can give me a thumbs down, but here we go. Share. And there, and thumbs up. Okay, so we're in business. There's the introduction, let's get going. I think the first thing I, I'd talk about is this. It was alluded to in the intro. Um, this is a picture that was taken last weekend. So it looks like any other launch, but um, it's not. This is the, the first launch of the Crew Dragon vehicle with astronauts on board. It's launched on the Falcon 9 rocket built and recently developed by SpaceX. And it took place last weekend. Um, it's a pretty significant moment in the history, I think, of human space exploration. And I think that going forward, we're going to look back on this um, as maybe a turning point, as one of several events, potentially in 20, the early 2020s, uh, where a lot changed for the world and for the world of spaceflight and, and for how we view that. Um, I did have the, the privilege of being involved with this team. I'm uh, part of the flight control team uh, that oversaw the docking between the approach and docking between the International Space Station and this vehicle in space. Um, pretty momentous uh, event as far as human spaceflight. This, this photograph uh, isn't anything special. I snapped it on my, my iPhone from Mission Control last weekend when I was working. But suffice to say, when we're working uh, in this control room, there's always one astronaut. I was the astronaut assigned to this mission. Um, we have lots of different views we can pull up. It's a little bit like Zoom, just a lot, a lot better and more technical. So we can pull in cameras from the International Space Station. And in this view, um, we've been working all night and we're, what we're seeing, uh, there's several different camera views on there. But if you look sort of to the lower left corner, just to the right of the American flag, you'll see a little bright spot. And then a little bit more to the right, you see a, a repeat of that image. That little bright spot is the Crew Dragon vehicle. It has two uh, astronauts on it. 
Um, it's traveling through space at, at close to 30,000 kilometers an hour at this point. And it's the first time that it's coming into view for the astronauts aboard the International Space Station. So from this point, we're gonna go through a, a fairly intricate, intricate dance to bring these two vehicles together and have them uh, in, in last weekend's case, actually autonomously dock. So last weekend, I said it was important. Maybe, maybe why do I say that? Um, it, it's a first in many ways. It's the first launch of crew from, from the US in close to 10 years since the retirement of the space shuttle. Um, it's the first crewed test flight of an orbital vehicle since in almost 40 years since the first flight of the space shuttle. Um, but probably most importantly, it's the first time that a commercial company has achieved orbital space flight with humans on board, the two NASA astronauts in that tiny little capsule that you see. And that's, that's really important for us to recognize. I, as I was in mission control and watching this, I kind of had the thought that it's worth it sometimes to compare spaceflight to the history of aviation. Spaceflight's very, very new. But if you think about aviation, we had an airplane fly with the Wright brothers in 1903. Um, and then we had lots of years and even decades of, of maybe in hindsight, slower progress. There was lots of challenges and obstacles and there were lots of people who died. And it was maybe difficult to, to envision where this was all going. Um, in 1927, Charles Lindbergh as a private person flew across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, people watched that. And, but I'd be willing to bet that if you were there watching that and seeing him land in Europe after crossing the ocean uh, in one flight, as opposed to many days and weeks as the world knew it at the time by ship, uh, you would never have been able to imagine how fundamentally and drastically the world was going to change and how quickly it was going to change because that had arrived, because we now had commercial private people who were able to do things like cross an ocean in an airplane. And I think there's kind of a parallel to be drawn with spaceflight and with the, the era that we're in right now. And as I go through my talk, um, I think that's, that's probably the one thing I want to leave you with is that we're really at a, a turning point, a really exciting dynamic time in human spaceflight. Things are about to change really, really quickly. Um, and it's something we wanna be involved with because it ultimately represents um, opportunity. So we'll back up a little bit before that though. I am, uh, like I said, I'm new to the space agency. I've been working for the Canadian Space Agency for about three years now in Space flight programs and astronaut timelines, that, that's a blink of an eye. That's not much time at all. So I very much consider myself to be new. Um, before that, I was an experimental pilot. I worked for the Air Force as a test pilot. I did a lot of my work on the F-18, which is the aircraft you see behind you in that photograph. Um, I spent a lot of time of my life flying before the space agency. That, that's mostly my background. Uh, I also spent a lot of time studying in, in university. I've studied uh, mechanical engineering, flight test engineering, uh, aerospace science, and, and some other things. Um, so I have a, a background that's a bit in academics, a bit in the operational aspect of test flying. But I think if I go back even further than that to, to being a child, I grew up in Eastern Alberta on a cattle farm. And I remember always being curious and wanting to explore. Curiosity exploration. Um, that, that was it. And as I grew older and I had different interests and I pursued them, aviation, of course, became the, the main one. Um, everything went back to that. It was a, a desire to explore and an innate curiosity. And I think that I, I still have those. I think those are the reasons I, I feel very blessed to have the job that I have right now. And I think that because of those, that curiosity and exploratory nature, I knew that I always wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I feel very lucky to, to be one, it, it's a little bit like winning the lottery, I feel. Uh, this ad that you see on the screen right now came out in 2016, and it, it was an announcement saying that the Canadian Space Agency was gonna hire two new astronauts. Um, I put my name in right away, of course, and, and, and went through the entire selection. Um, but I, ne I never really grasped or, or anticipated actually making it all the way through and, and being there at the end. It's a, fairly daunting selection process. Here, there's a few photos from it, um, but it, it takes place over a year. You're tested in, in everything, lot physical tests, mental tests, tested uh, extensively in terms of your, your interpersonal skills and how you interact with different teams. 
Um, and you know, you just you just kind of have to show up and, and do your very best. Uh, the group starts large. We had over 4,700 applicants, very talented, capable, smart Canadians, many of whom would have would have done the job just fine, really, really would have. Um, but of course, it's a selection. And so you, you just keep going from event to event to event, and the group gets smaller and smaller and smaller um, until somehow you're, you might be lucky enough to be at the end of it. Um, it leads to the question uh, maybe of, of what makes a good astronaut or what would the Canadian Space Agency have been looking for. And I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you that if I look at the colleagues I work with here at NASA, at Johnson Space Center, and within the Canadian Space Agency, um, we all come from very different backgrounds, but we all have some things in common. We all have academic experience. We spend a lot of time studying in university. Um, we all have operational experience. We've all done science or, or a, some kind of a mission in what I call a high stress, high risk, high consequence environment where your decisions really matter. Um, we all, we're all very interested in health and fitness. And I think that it's also important to point out that we all, um, we're, we're good at, I think, at getting along with people. We have um, an interpersonal skill set that allows us to integrate with new teams in all kinds of different circumstances which is something that's quite important now for space flight because we're doing very long duration missions um, approaching a year actually and we're going to talk about that here in the next few slides. So this is uh, the group right now of current Canadian Space Agency astronauts. I was selected with Jenny Seide Gibbons who's beside me in the, in the center. Uh, she was a professor at Cambridge at the time of her hiring. David St. Jacques is on the right. He just returned from seven months in space or a couple months ago. And then Jeremy Hansen is on the left. This is uh, where picture was taken where we work on a day-to-day -day basis at Johnson Space Center. And in the background, you can see some of the airplanes that we fly. Um, and here we see a, a sample. So three photos of, of what I've been up to over the last few years. Um, when you're hired, you, you go straight back into school. And that, that might sound a little bit funny to say, but there, there's a lot of training to do as an astronaut. And when you're initially hired, the first thing you do is you start a two and a half year training program. Um, and these pictures are from that program. You're gonna study everything uh, under the moon, maybe pun intended. You're gonna look at the International Space Station and all the technical systems on it, orbital mechanics and rockets and space vehicles. You're gonna do a lot of science, uh, specifically bioscience, You'll do microgravity flying, you'll do survival. Uh, you'll learn about spacewalking. You spend a lot of time underwater in the neutral buoyancy lab. That's the picture on the right. Um, you have to learn to speak Russian, which is a, a very difficult thing to do, I, I can attest. Um, so there's a lot of training, a lot of studying, but for the people that, that do it, who the new hires as astronauts, uh, it's subject matter, of course, that we're very, very passionate about. Uh, and it's also sort of sort of in us because, as I mentioned, we've all come from backgrounds where we spent a significant amount of our, our time, our life, if not in some cases the majority, um, studying. So, so to study for another two and a half years is uh, something that we see, I think, is almost fun. When that two and a half years ends, uh, for me, this is just uh, back in January, um, you do graduate from NASA and there, there's a little ceremony. This is a photograph from it. So this is the most recent NASA astronaut class to graduate. And embedded in this class were two, the two Canadian astronauts, myself and Jenny. Um, I like this photo because it, you know, I, I'll go back to what I said at the very beginning. I wanna leave you with a sense for how quickly things are changing in spaceflight right now and how much opportunity is out there. So in this image, there's a giant picture of the moon in the background. And this group of astronauts at NASA, uh, you know, Canadians, we're kind of the, we're just, we're a part of it, we, but um, it, it's mostly a NASA group. And this NASA group uh, is referred to as the Artemis generation in reference to the, the current NASA program um, to take women and men back to the moon. With respect to how fast things are changing, I think it, it should be pointed out that a lot of people in this picture on the NASA side are already training for lunar uh, experiences for lunar missions. And it's very likely that people in this photograph um, on the NASA side are going to find themselves on the moon in the, the not too distant future. We're talking about uh, a, a matter of years. Um, 
So we'll come, we'll come back to that again, but I, I do wanna reinforce things are, are happening at NASA really, really quickly in the field of uh, human space flight right now. Um, interesting photo, this was taken underground in Slovenia and Italy, uh, and it goes to this question. So I did the two and a half year astronaut basic candidacy course. Once you graduate from that, uh, what do you do? Well, you continue to train, uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is you start to work. Uh, you start to work different technical jobs in support of the human space flight programs uh, that we share among the, the spacefaring nations of the world. So train and work. This is a photograph from training. Um, it's what we call a space analog mission. Um, so in this particular case, I traveled to Slovenia and Italy for three weeks. Uh, we were uh, on an expedition there, the six of us. This is a a crew of six astronauts from around the world, myself from Canada, of course. Um, we also have in that photo European astronauts, Russian, Japanese, and American astronauts. And we're doing a science expedition in, a, in an unsurveyed cave system, exploring it, surveying it, and doing a whole wide uh, wealth of experimental scientific work um, for investigators from different universities around the world. So we get a whole bunch out of it. We get good science out of it. Um, the the, the gover local governments get a cave survey and they get the physical exploration out of it. Um, but really from our training perspective, we get really good training out of it. We call it a space analog because the environment underground, completely isolated, uh, is in many ways very much like space. You have to communicate with the mission control team via video only once a day. Um, you're completely dependent on your team members and you're in a, a dangerous environment where if you make the wrong decision, it can have life and death consequences really, really quickly. It's an environment that's difficult to live in um, and even more difficult to work in and to try to do meaningful, complicated science, uh, which is what we're down there to do. So a, a flavor of the training that we, we get to do on an ongoing basis. And then I said, in addition to training, we, we start to work. And this is a picture from, from that. This is, was also taken last weekend. So all astronauts after they, they graduate from basic training are assigned to different technical projects. Um, I have a couple. This one is, is the one that I, I think is worth talking about today. As I mentioned at the beginning, assigned to the flight control team um, that helps to, to work and oversee the, the docking of the International Space Station to that first Crew Dragon. Uh, capsule, which we did last weekend. Um, of course, it's not just something we did last weekend. It, it's this effort has been underway for for years. There's a lot of developmental work that goes into um, figuring out how it's going to be done, the procedures, building the procedures, testing the procedures, and then ultimately getting to a point where you start simulating uh, the events over and over and over uh, with the goal of trying to simulate everything that could possibly go wrong. Uh, but eventually we were able to, to come together and to, to put it in the, put the master plan in the work and execute it um, last weekend. And so that's just a, a view uh, of my life on certain days. I'm there sitting at the, the Capcom console to just behind my right shoulder, you'll see uh, the NASA flight director. And then in front of us are, are a, a whole team of engineers, subject matter experts, each one responsible for the control of a certain part of the International Space Station. Which leads me uh, to this. I know that everyone tuning in is, is aware that this is the International Space Station, but a, a couple things I wanna point out. Um, it's big. So at the center of the screen, you can see near the bottom, the Canadarm2 outstretched, kind of pointing straight down towards the earth. Um, just for scale perspective, the, the part of the arm that you can see there is about 20 meters long. So it shows up on the screen as just an inch, but it gives you an idea of just how, how ginormous this thing is. Um, it is likely, maybe, perhaps, probably, per, maybe the most complicated thing that humans have built. It was assembled in space where it is. Uh, it was assembled at, you know, in free flight in a microgravity environment, traveling at speeds of, of 28,000-ish kilometers per hour. Uh, and it's been there for quite a while. So it's 20 years now we've passed that milestone where we've had the International Space Station orbiting the planet with a permanent human presence on it um, for all of those 20 years, which is quite remarkable to think of. Many of you in the audience are gonna be younger than, than 20 years old. And so uh, that's certainly something that was not the case when I was your age, where we had had 
astronauts living and working in space for my entire life permanently. Um, but it is the case now. And it's pretty neat to think about that and to think about how many more astronauts and people we're going to have working and living in space permanently, not just here, but around the moon and, and on to Mars, which is what we're going to talk about. Um, Canada is a prime partner in the International Space Station. We built the robotics system. Uh, we're, con we're considered a, a world expert in the field of space robotics. This is a view of some of those Canadian built components. The robotic system is very important to the operation of the space station. It's, it's a critical piece of infrastructure. Um, the space station does, you know, does not work. Does not, we don't have a space station without the robotic system. It, it was the robotics that, that put it together and that continue to work 24 hours a day to, to keep the thing flying. Um, I like to draw attention to that too. There, there's five partners in this grand endeavor of, of the International Space Station. Um, the United States, Russia, the European Union, Japan, and then Canada. So Canada relatively, we're a, we're a small partner in terms of our size as a country and in terms of our, you know, maybe our means, but we always, when it comes to space flight and exploration, uh, end up coming to the table with very significant contributions that the world benefits from. And the International Space Station is a, a really good example of that. There's an international crew aboard uh, permanently. In this photo, you see astronauts from the United States, um, where else? from Russia, and then from Canada. You see David uh, hanging apparently upside down to you up in the top right of the photograph. Because of our contribution to the, the International Space Station, we do get to send astronauts there from Canada. Uh, right now, we do so about once every four or five years. This is a photograph from, from the last person to be Canadian to be on the station, David. And this photograph, he's doing science. Astronauts on the space station do science a lot. It's really the reason we built the space station. Um, if astronauts aren't involved with physically controlling, driving, if you will, fixing, maintaining the space station, then they're involved with doing science. And there's sort of two flavors to that science. The first, as you could imagine, is space research. We're using the space station to study technologies, to prove out new systems, that are going to help us take humans, human beings further than the ISS and on to places like the moon and then Mars. So, so we're doing all that work. But secondly, and maybe more importantly, uh, we do a lot of science on the space station that, that doesn't necessarily have an application in space. Its applications are here on Earth. So the International Space Station is a gigantic laboratory. Uh, that has the, the good fortune to be found in microgravity, where you, you cannot recreate that very easily anyway here on Earth. And that allows us to do a whole bunch of research, particularly in fields like medicine and healthcare, um, that ultimately let us discover new things, build new technologies that make life better for humans here, here on Earth. And uh, we'll, we'll show you some examples of that. These are um, pictures of of robotics, they're, they're medical robotic systems used uh, on planet Earth to do diagnosis in one case and to do operation brain operations in a second case. So um, they're called neuroarm in the first example and um, image guided autonomous ro robotics in the second example. You could, you know, I don't, wouldn't expect it to, to remember those names or acronyms. I barely do, but this is the the cool part about this. Uh, they're Canadian inventions. Um, they're Canadian inventions that are making, in, in one case, cancer patients, and in many other cases, all sorts of other patients, um, lives much, much better because of the treatment that they enable on Earth. Um, and they're Canadian inventions that are doing this because of our space program. So they're inventions that we, we term spin-offs, but they're inventions that came from research and development work that was done by Canada to build the robotic systems that we have in space. In building those very complex systems, we learn new things, we gain new technologies, and we're able to turn those around and say, you know what, they actually have a big use and application in other fields, like in, in this case, medicine here on Earth, um, which is a, another important aspect of uh, the human space exploration programs that we're involved with. Um, I talk a lot about human spaceflight and because, of course, that's the, the part of it that I'm closest to, space exploration and, and doing that exploration with uh, human beings. But 
Um, I do want to, at the end here, talk about a couple of the other projects that we have ongoing at the Canadian Space Agency, because space flight is, is so much more than human space flight. And um, I, I know that this audience, cer certainly, if we're, if we're going to start talking about astronomy, I know that we're, we're all very much aware of that. Um, but maybe for some of the, the younger folks who would be listening today, I'll, I'll talk about two quick things. The first one is this. Uh, this is a rendition of something we call the Radar Sat Constellation Mission. Um, this is three satellites that were designed, invented, if you will, by Canada. They launched to space last year. They're in orbit about the Earth, and they use a very specific radar uh, waveform, synthetic aperture radar, to map the Earth many, many different times a day. Uh, Canada, like we're an expert in the field of space robotics, medical robotics. Um, we've also become an expert with this synthetic aperture radar. This data, these data that come from uh, these satellites are used uh, by departments all across our Canadian government, federal, provincial, municipal governments. Um, the data is also used by countries all around the world. Uh, and it's data that is used for very important applications like uh, dealing with illegal fishing, like monitoring climate change, like informing policymakers uh, with the information they need to, to help tackle some of these bigger problems. Um, and that is a trend that is, is worth thinking about too, as, as long as we're on the subject of space flight. We're finding more and more applications for space data, and we're very quickly entering an era where we are not just dependent on space infrastructure for our day-to-day -day lives, you, you are already, I mean, if you're an average young person living in Canada, you interact with, with space-based equipment maybe 100 times a day. You know, if you go to the bank, if you use your phone, if you use the internet, if you watch me right now, um, if, you, if you navigate someplace in your car, this is all space-enabled infrastructure. We call it invisible infrastructure. We're very dependent on space. Um, but we're becoming more and more dependent on space in some of the examples that you see here in using space data, not just to connect us and to facilitate our lives, but to help us deal with the big problems of our generation. Space data, you know, the ability to take a, a single satellite and monitor um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide levels all over the world, that's a huge ability. The ability to watch uh, water levels, ice flows, illegal uh, fishing I mentioned, um, these are all sources of data that space is bringing to us at an increasing rate, um, and they're really enabling us to go after these big, difficult problems like food production, like climate change, like water level depletion, and try to have the information we need to solve them. Um, and Canada's involved with that through RadarSat, through a host of other uh, satellites as well. This is uh, another project Canada is involved with. I, I know that everybody watching this is aware. It's the, but again, for the younger folks, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, this is an international project that Canada is also partnered on. It's the biggest, most powerful complex space telescope uh, ever built. It will launch hopefully next year. It has Canadian components on it. It's going to travel out really, really far to something that we call a Lagrange point. And from there, it's going to look deeper into the cosmos and into space time than, than we've ever been able to look before. Um, and you can bet that it's going to change really fundamentally um, some of what we know about the cosmos and about our solar system and, and about our place in all of that. So we look forward to it. And I think it's, uh, it's again, it's a remarkable aspect um, of the program to, to have Canadians and Canadian researchers and companies and contractors um, so involved. This is uh, the, the last slide, and then I'll, I'll answer a few questions if there are. Um, NASA calls this the roadmap, so Earth, Moon, and Mars. And this is, is where we're going. And uh, I want you to walk away from this presentation knowing that this is very likely to happen in, in this generation. This is the generation that will do this. Um, that will go to Mars. I think that the first person to walk on Mars is most certainly alive right now. She or he is probably in middle school somewhere. Um, it, they could be a Canadian, they, they could be from anywhere in the world, I don't know. Uh, but these, this idea of a human mission to Mars is very likely to happen in this lifetime. Uh, and that, you know, philosophically is just so 
crazy to think about. And, and it's just very exciting to me. The first step in this roadmap is the earth and we're, we're complete nearing completion with that. That's what I've been talking to you about. So for 20 years, we've been proving to ourselves that we can keep humans alive in the vacuum of space in low earth orbit permanently. And we've done that more or less with the International Space Station. It was a big, big effort, um, but we've had people living on it for, for 20 years now, and we've figured a lot of it out. And so we're nearing the point now where we're gonna take everything that we've learned from that, from the International Space Station, and move it out to the next step in this roadmap, which you see is, is the moon. And we're gonna take that same kind of construct, the idea of a outpost with human presence on it, and move it into orbit around the moon. We're gonna learn a whole bunch more and make a whole bunch of new discoveries and probably fail a few times too, but ultimately we'll conquer those challenges. And then once we have that figured out, we're taking the ultimate step, which is onto Mars. And so we're going from kind of the space station at 400 miles away from earth, pretty close actually, to the moon at a thousand times farther, 400,000 ish kilometers. And then we're gonna go so many times farther than that to the point where we're talking about tens and tens of millions of kilometers to, to Mars. And that's something that's really difficult even for me to, to think about this idea of how we would keep humans alive for a long period of time on Mars and during the journey there and back. Um, but that's what space travel does. It, it takes stuff that we think is impossible that we've known to be impossible for the entire history of, of humanity. And through key events, it, it makes it possible and it changes our entire understanding of everything. Um, and that's what we're gonna see happen with Mars. I mean, right now it would be excessively challenging to go to Mars, but I think it could be done. I think that at an engineering level, we see how we're going to do this someday. We see the technology, we see the plans coming together. Um, we can see it as a realistic thing. If we were to go do it right now, it would be very challenging. It would be extremely high risk for the crew involved, um, but, but we can see how it's gonna be done. And in another decade after the moon in the thirties and the forties, um, there's no doubt in my mind at all that it will be done. You know, if we go back to what I, I started talking about today, comparing aviation and space flight, where we were with aviation in 1927 and sort of the first big private commercial enterprise crossing an ocean, I don't think anyone would ever have imagined where that was gonna take us and how quickly it was gonna take us there. And now, like I said, we're at a sort of a similar point in space travel. Um, and I don't think anyone can imagine what the future holds, uh, but it's gonna be breathtaking and it's gonna be full of opportunity. And I, I just feel really, really lucky uh, right now to have a part in it. And I also feel really, really lucky that Canada as a country uh, is involved in it as we are. So I'll leave you with that thought. Uh, Mars in the, the, distant, the distant future, but um, take my word on it, not that distant future. So I think with that, let me thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, you have me back in sight. Okay. Thanks, Joshua, so much. Uh, my name is Matthew. I'm one of the staff members at uh, uh, the Trotche Observatory and the H.R. McMillan Space Center. I'm a RASC member. Um, your, your life is basically what I imagined I wanted to do growing up, you know, from youth. That was, that was the plan. Um, but thankfully, you know, we have a, another group of youth that are also here asking questions right now. I, this is one of those things I wish I got to do when I was a kid. So it's pretty cool that we, we have this group. And not only that, I think it's exciting because, as you've said, these might be the people, one of these youth that are in here right now might be one of these people that's actually going to go on to the moon or, or go on to Mars. So we're going to take five of their questions uh, right now. Um, I'm going to start with Basim. So Basim, if you're, if you're in the group here, we'll get you unmuted and uh, we'll get you the chance to ask your question to astronaut Joshua Kutrick. All right, Basim, you are unmuted, so you can go ahead and ask your question. See, thank you everyone. And thank you, Joshua, for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. It's, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today and with the rest of you. Um, however, I'd also like to ask, um, how would the discovery of a single cellular or multicellular or organism on Mars, Europa, Titan, or any other body within the solar system 
revolutionize all of science? Yeah, uh, great question. I don't think it's a, an overreach to, to use the word revolutionize. Um, you know, lot, lots of specifics, but, but in general, if we were to discover, and, and we, we might, I mean, this, this is possible. I'll, I'll talk about a, a few projects here maybe in a minute, but if we were to discover evidence of life currently or in the past, uh, as close as somewhere else in our solar system, um, the most important effect of that to, to me is that it shows us how wrong yet again we've been in the past. And it, it, because it does that, it changes our view of everything, of our world, of our existence, of the role that we have to play. It changes the questions that we will start asking through, through scientific process. It changes the answers that we're gonna look for. And the effect of that is that it leads us to, to you know, countless new scientific discoveries that forever alter life on earth here. It's, I like thinking about history and I, you know, it's important to realize that we're at such a moment where this could happen. I mean, we have, we have projects, right? James Webb Space Telescope will be looking for life in its search for exoplanets and its analysis of, of their atmospheres. Um, the Canadian Space Agency is involved with a mission called OSIRIS-REx right now. It's been flying to a, a distant asteroid for the last several years. It's there now. It's about to do a touch and go on that asteroid. It's like amazing. These, these words that I'm speaking, think about that. It's science fiction, but it's happening this year. It's going to bring that sample all the way back. It'll take three years to get back to Earth. And then those samples are going to end up in laboratories around the world, including in Canada, because we're a partner. But another project looking for life. Um, and then just some of the stuff that we've learned so recently about places that you mentioned in your question, uh, moons around Saturn and, and, and Jupiter. Um, you know, we just continually to show ourselves how little we actually thought we knew in the past and open our eyes to such a, a wide wealth of new discovery. And that's what's going to happen. To me, it's a little bit like being, um, you know, you go back and, and, and choose your metaphor. But there was a time, of course, when the scientific consensus around the world was that it was impossible to cross an ocean. Never mind that there existed on the other side of that ocean. Uh, vast communities and peoples and cultures and, and resources. And, and never mind the fact that maybe someday not only it would be possible to cross an ocean, but that it would be possible to cross an ocean in a matter of hours. And now we're in suborbital range and we can do it in minutes. Um, and if you go back further than that, there was a time when, when the scientific consensus of the world was that uh, the planets orbited around us um, or that even we were at the center of the, the universe. I mean. Um, it will change fundamentally uh, how the textbooks are written and how we, we view our, ourselves. And, um, and I think it, it's, it's really fascinating because it's something that could happen. Um, it could. So science is there. It's doing great things right now. Great question. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Basim. Uh, next, Thank we have you. Jack. Jack, you're up. And when he should unmute. I'm, I'm just unmuting him right now. Okay, there. What was your favorite part of training to become an astronaut? Hi, Jack. The good question. My favorite part, um, probably EVA. That stands for extravehicular activity, which is spacewalking. So at the Johnson Space Center here, not, not too far from where I'm sitting right now, we have a ginormous pool. We have a, a whole space station inside that pool. And we spend a lot of time as astronaut students underwater uh, doing spacewalking. I like spacewalking because it's very challenging in a couple different ways. It's very physically challenging. We, we are in these giant space suits trying to maneuver um, for six or seven hours at a time. Uh, it's very physically fatiguing work, um, but it's also very challenging mentally. You have to be switched on and your brain has to be actively working. You cannot make a mistake for the entire duration of that run. Uh, and you're working through very technical procedures. So for me, it's, I, I really enjoy that combination of the mental and the physical challenge. I think that uh, that's a little bit of the reason probably why I enjoy test flying. And it's a, it's a you know, I used to um, climb mountains. I, I found the same challenge there where you had to be mentally on and making the right decision second after second after second in a, a physically demanding environment. So 
I like the spacewalking part. And uh, thanks for your question. I love your background, by the way. I think you win the prize today. For <laughs> Jack, you also share a, a name with a character from Doctor Who. I don't know if you know that or not. As soon as I saw that, I was like, Jack Harkness, he's a character from Doctor Who. Uh, all right, next up, we have Davian. Davian, your question. And, and Davian, yeah. All right, Davian, you're unmuted and you can ask your question if you'd like. Are you training to go to the moon soon? Am I training to go to the moon? Thank you for the question, Damien. I personally am not. I'm training for a, a long duration mission to the International Space Station. Um, but other astronauts here in Houston at Johnson Space Center are NASA astronauts. Um, and the programs of the world are all sort of pointing at the moon right now. Canada partnered last year with NASA on something called Gateway. Uh, the Gateway project is in about you know, over the next five, 10 years going to make a space station around the moon. Canada's building a uh, next generation um, intelligent robotic system to help put that, that station together. And so, although Jenny and I, we're not training right now for the moon specifically, uh, I do think it's only a matter of time before Canadian astronauts are. I don't know how much time, but it, it's certainly in the future because uh, Canada is a, a partner on this bold vision to, to go and, and conduct um, exploration around the moon right now. Uh, great question. It could be... Uh, it could be us, it could be those who follow us, those who are younger than I am, like yourself. All right, thank you. Uh, next up we have Tara. Tara, what is your question for astronaut job? Hi, so my interest in, in going to space came from astronomy. I was wondering if all the astronauts get trained in astronomy before going to space, and do you think it's useful? Tara, I, I do think it's useful. I've studied astronomy very, very minimally. I've done about two courses in it. Um, my, a colleague of mine, David St. Jacques, uh, was an astrophysicist. He's, so he studied it a bit more extensively. I would, but this, this is the thing. I, somebody gave me a, a nudge that there was gonna be a question along these lines today. And I was like, oh, I don't have a good answer. And I don't have a good answer because um, we don't actually study it as part of astronaut training here at Johnson. We, we were exposed to it maybe. We study a lot of other sciences. We spend a lot of time on geology, um, my, uh, bi bi biology, bioscience stuff, um, but we, we don't touch that much on astronomy. Um, I don't have a good reason for, for why. I, I think it's a, a, something that we should study. Um, and I do think that it's you know, astronomy is, is so cool for one of the reasons that you said in your question is that it, it lets us look so much further past what we have here on earth and it opens up our minds and our imaginations to, to inspire us and to ask us what's out there and what could be possible. So uh, keep, keep going. I think you got a, a pretty promising interest there. Oh, we got time for one more question and that is from Arden. So Arden, what is your question? Hi, my original question was, what do you look forward to most about the future of space travel? But over the course of the presentation, I came up with a new one. Where do you see humans in the future, like 100 years from now, where do you see humans in space? Good question. Um, so the, what am I most excited about? I think um, at the start of this, today's events, the Governor General Julie Piet, also an astronaut, talked about how spaceflight was accessible to, to a, a small group of people as it is right now. You, you know, the people are here in Houston and, and maybe a couple places in, in Europe and Russia, and that's it. Um, and she talked about how astronomy made space accessible to everyone. Um, what I'm, one of the things I'm most excited about is how that's about to change. Uh, I think spaceflight is about to become a lot more accessible to people uh, in the, the direct sense of people going to space, um, but also just in, in terms of our dependency on space and how we view space and how much space is part of our lives. So it's certainly about to become much more uh, accessible to people. And um, I think that's a good thing. That's, that's something I'm very excited about. 
your, your second question, where would humans be in a hundred years from now? Uh, I'm very confident humans will have been on Mars and farther. Um, but this is the thing, that question is, is, is awe-inspiring. It's very difficult to answer. You know, 20 years ago, I don't think we could have predicted that we would be flying spaceships from Florida with the first stage, this ginormous skyscraper of a rocket landing back at the exact same place it, it launched from, fueling up and taking off again. I don't think we could have predicted that. And in less than 20 years, that's happened. So from 100 years from now, I don't know, but it, it's going to be uh, it's going to be wonderful, and we're going to be a lot farther away from planet Earth than we are right now. Thank you to all the youth that joined in today, and of course, thank you to all the audience that are streaming in on live. Joshua, thank you so much for being here with us. We're all going to be watching your mission so closely, and we're all behind you when you're finally going to be lifting up there into the cosmos. Um, I'm actually going to pass it off to Haley because Haley has a gift for you for for joining us today. Oh, thank thank you. Thanks, uh, Matthew. The, the pleasure is mine. Unfortunately, Haley has accidentally quit the uh, okay. conversation. <laughs> Haley's out. <laughs> Just so, letting her back in, then she'll be able to go through with that. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Haley's back. Haley's back. Okay, here she is. Haley, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much, Josh. And on behalf of the Vancouver Center, we would love to give you a gift of a toque that we have. Um, I'm going to just share this as well. So this is going to be me um, sharing. And the toque that I'm going to present you is the toque for the moon. And that is um, made by one of our RASP members and we will arrange to have that sent to you. So, um, and awesome. Th that's thank very you so kind much. of you guys. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you. Um, so we will see you somewhere out there. We will see you. I hope to, to run into you um, at yeah. some point. Maybe when, when this is all, all over with, we can come and visit you guys. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. We're going to end this now and we're going to move into the next uh, part of our events. Thank you and have thank a great you. day. Take care, guys. So, so I'm just going to let folks know before we jump into that next sec uh, section, we're going to take a quick two or three minute break uh, to run off, have um, a quick bio break, grab a drink of water, uh, and then we'll be back on our YouTube channel uh, in about five minutes or so. Yes. Yeah, and we'll be back with uh, Professor Sarah Seeger. So make sure everyone tunes back in for that. Yeah, don't go far. <laughs> See you all soon.